Good morning. Good morning. <laughs> Appreciate it. Please turn with me to James, the first chapter, as we consider this morning the subject well watered. Well watered. Why well watered? Why well watered? Well, because there are two themes that seem to stand out in the book of James, and this is a, a kind of a scratch the surface lesson. Why? Because James, I've heard described as uh, New Testament Proverbs. And as I began to read through it this way, um, it, it, it seems like a cute description, but it's hard for a preacher to preach because if you know anything about Proverbs, they don't organize so good for communication. And James is like that. He seems to move from subject to subject. And so as I struggled this week to kind of see, OK, what does this thematically wrap itself up into in something I can, can communicate? Well watered seemed to be that theme. Why? Because there are two branches that seem to move through this theme. See, as seeds, we see it often in Jesus' metaphors. It's the question of, okay, what kind of crop are we yielding? That's the well watered. But the other thing that he warns us against are being watered down. And if you read the book of James, it ain't a happy book. And so it'd be one thing for me to talk about well watered, but if all I do is talk about the well watered part, I'm ignoring half of what James is talking about. And so what he's doing in terms of the Proverbs is he's giving us wisdom that helps us understand, okay, this is what it looks like to be well watered, and this is what it looks like to be watered down. And over and over again, that's the theme that seems to arise in these chapters as he's going from subject to subject to subject, and it wraps up in three different topics that I've learned so far. And that's why I said this is a scratch the surface lesson. Why? Because I think this is really just starting to scratch the surface on my understanding of what this book is actually doing. But the themes that seem to come up over and over again are, look, what's my attitude toward um, purity? Wow, that's a word that we don't use so much, right? But it literally comes up at least twice in the book of James. What's my attitude toward, as Brian has already brought out in um, the, the third chapter, what's my attitude towards my mouth? Wow. And lastly, what's my attitude towards my money? And these are three things that James brings up over and over again. And if you look them up, you're not going to necessarily be able to word search them because they don't come up literally, but they are referred to or inferred to or, or inferred throughout the book. And let's kind of see, hopefully, how it unfolds as we begin to read in James chapter one, beginning at verse two. Count it all joy, my brothers, when you meet trials of various kinds. For you know that the testing of your faith produces steadfastness. And let steadfastness have its full effect that you may be perfect and complete, lacking nothing. And one of the things we've talked about as we've gone through these more challenging books. Okay, what's the hack, Marcus, as you go through all this end times prophecy? What's the point that I can live through today if I never get to the point where I actually see the end of days? And the only end of days I ever see is my own death. Well, we talked about understanding the love of truth is the anchor of the float. Well, I hate to pick on you, but Miss Shelley just came back from vacation. And one of the things she said, she, um, uh, her most favorite part, and correct me if I'm wrong, was learning to snorkel. And part of the relief of learning to snorkel was realizing you didn't have to be a great swimmer because they got tools that help keep you afloat. And that's what some of these hacks are. They are things that help keep us afloat in these otherwise turbulent scriptures. They talk about, yeah, there's some things we were doing well, but there's some things we need to work on, honestly. The hack in end times prophecy was understanding if you love truth, you will be insured against every deception that the enemy come, um, throws against you, whether it comes in the form, like we said, or of the, uh, the man of lawlessness, or of the uh, antichrist, or the, the man of sin, which may uh, be very similar to all those. The one thing that help, helps get us through is loving the truth. Well, here in James, the thing that's going to help get us through is steadfastness. And that's not a word that we use every day. So as I'm looking through these verses, I'm like, okay, what does steadfastness look like? And we've talked about it before in the Psalms, but this week it became more clear, as Jeremiah mentioned this morning in class, that whole concept, okay, if we're getting together informally, what kinds of things can we do to reach out to people who are outside of our normal demographic? Well, college kids don't mind turning on uh, a game while they look at food. I mean, uh, looking at a game while they're eating food. We said food can be one of those things that's central to our gatherings. Just having the game on in the background or some kind of icebreaker as a, um, you know, centerpiece or something for folks to do so they don't feel so awkward while they're trying to get to know these folks in this strange environment. And one of the stalwarts of hockey for a while was Wayne Gretzky. And one of the things that I learned about Wayne Gretzky was way before a lot of our times, he was known as the great one. And I heard him talk one time about a bad game he had in, I don't know what they call it, youth league. 
And his dad pulled him aside because by this time, Gretzky had already had a great following and people were coming to see him as a teenager play hockey. And his dad said, son, a bad game, eh, we all have them. But you have to understand, if you're underprepared, that's a different story. See, because people are coming to watch you. And your bad game isn't the same as mine. See, if you're not steadfast, that affects your brand, that affects your reputation, and that affects what people think about, one, because they understand we're all human, right? It's one thing to have an off day, all athletes have them, but if you at this age get in the habit of letting people see that you come to the ice unprepared, then you're setting yourself up and you're setting your fans up for a lot of disappointment. And that's what um, steadfastness is. We call it in your workplace being a professional. It's me showing up, providing a consistent product, whether or not I'm in the mood to do it. Why? Because we talked about it last week. If Apple uh, announces a release date, when we were talking about that issue of truth, we said, we got this thing called my truth. And it's not always the same as the truth. But we hold Apple accountable to the truth even if I want my truth to dictate my conduct. See, Apple's release date doesn't get flexibility. If they say it's gonna be one thing and it turns out to be another, they better issue an apology. If they say they're issuing a new iPhone, but they're charging $1,000 for the exact same thing you got in your hand, they're gonna be some issues. And likewise, they don't make brand recognition by issuing the same old stuff over and over again. Understand what that says to me as an individual. Uh, does Apple get the luxury of saying, ah, we had a bad day, so I'm not going to, the iPhone's going to have to be there <laughs> whether or not <laughs> we like it or not. We get that on our jobs, right? We get that in our lives. Academically, I can't so much take a break with realizing I got to make it up. Because if I decide I'm going to flag a test, what happens? Do they say, oh, we're going to bump that one out, Marcus? That's okay. Sometimes, maybe. <laughs> but you know there's some compensation that has to be done if you are not steadfast in the classroom. It's going to hurt to make up what you've lost. Same thing in your job. If you show up in a situation where, ah, I wasn't so much feeling it. You understand at a certain point, I gotta suck it up. Why? Because it's gonna cost you reputation. And I heard it described this way. When I was out in the working world, they assign us mentors. And one of the things they talked about, I've, I've talked about it before, it was back in my days in Minnesota, it was just doing public service. It's like, Marcus, we're living in a situation where not everybody um, has the time to check your word. And so even though we're in a profession that has a reputation for playing around with the truth, that's not the reality of what we do. See, you come in with a certain amount of what we call goodwill. And goodwill is the assumption that I can take you at face value. Everything you do to maintain your goodwill means you can walk into a situation, simply tell someone this is what it is, and they'll just believe you. Oh, but take a break on being steadfast and telling the truth. And the one thing this man who probably hadn't set foot in a church in 30 years was telling me was that you do not know what it's going to take for you to rebuild the level of credibility you've lost with one lie. And so that is the picture of steadfastness that we are seeing in the book of James when he's saying be steadfast. It's like, I can't take a break. I can take a break on truth if I want just because I'm upset with such and so in that courtroom. But understand what that's reflecting on is me. And ultimately what he's saying is my performance cannot fluctuate according to whether or not I want to get it done. Because ultimately, there's a certain amount of damage I can do to the other person on the other side of the bar, if we're talking about a courtroom, or the other side of the water cooler, if we're talking about a workspace, right? But eventually, there's only so much I can, so much damage I can do to them before it begins to reflect on me, and I'm the one who then has to do the damage control on my reputation. And so that's what steadfastness is. Steadfastness is being a professional. It's what Gretzky's dad was talking to him about when he had that bad game. It's like, son, you can have, people can forgive you for a bad game. What they will be less willing to forgive is a short, 
shrifted, what's the term? I don't know. <laughs> it's bad effort. We see it all the time. I remember um, just last night, um, one of the, as Duke, Mike Krzyzewski coached his last basketball game, one of the things that the commentators mentioned last night is like, he's like, look, I don't care. I went to North Carolina, I don't care who won. The one thing I am happy about is none of these kids have to go home with their heads hanging. Because unlike past years, when we've seen the decision come down to one kid who made a major blunder that ended up going viral or running on the news all the next week, none of these kids are going to make the news for messing up. No matter whether they won or they lost, Mike Krzyzewski goes out on a night when all the kids played well, no matter what mistakes they made. And so we can forgive the fact that somebody made a, uh, missed a free throw or somebody made a turnover. The air is human. But if you fall short on your effort, that's when the patience with our mistakes begins to run short. And that's the lasting impression that he had from a game where millions of dollars were traded. The lasting impression that was made on this man was that the kids can go home with their heads hung high. Why? Because they were steadfast. And that's what James is talking about. So that's the hat that runs through the rest of this book. If you are steadfast, as you make mistakes, forgiveness is in abundance. So you don't have to look at the book of James as a condemnation because we all stumble in many ways as he's already read. If you can bridle your mouth, you're perfect. Good luck with that. We're going to get to my adventures in that this week once we keep reading. But <laughs> down to um, verse 8 as we keep reading. We stopped in, um, in verse 4. Um, one of the things he's going to eventually mention is, uh, we already talked about purity is one of the first things he's going to mention. So as he transitions from talking about being perfect and complete, lacking nothing, tool in that, what? Steadfastness. Being a professional, verse 5, he's going to say, if any of you lacks wisdom, let him ask God who gives generously to all without reproach, and it will be given him. But let him ask in faith with no doubting, for the one who doubts is like a wave of the sea that is driven and tossed by the wind. For that person should, suppose, sorry, should not suppose he will receive anything from the Lord, for he is double-minded and unstable in all his ways. And that goes to that issue of purity as opposed to double-mindedness. Why? Because at the end of this chapter, if you go um, forward with me to verse 26, he's literally going to mention that concept of purity. If anyone thinks he is religious and does not bridle his tongue but deceives his heart, this person's religion is worthless. Religion that is pure and undefiled before God, the Father, is, to, is, oh, I'm sorry, is this, to visit orphans and widows in their afflictions and to keep oneself unstained from the world. That issue of purity is going to come up again in chapter 3 after the segment that Brian read beginning at, I don't really want to read the entire section now. Um, let's start at verse 17. But the wisdom from above is first of all pure and then peaceable, gentle, open to reason, full of mercy and good fruits, impartial and sincere. And once again, it's going to come up in chapter 4. Verse 8. Draw near to God, and he will draw near to you. Cleanse your hands, you sinners, and purify your hearts, you. Once again, he's going to go back to that place we left off in chapter 1, you double-minded. So let's go back to chapter 1 as we look at that concept of purity. Purity, awkward term. Why? Because a lot of times it brings to my mind concepts of, yes, concepts of um, sexual purity. And we're in a culture where that's rare nowadays. And so I didn't take me very long for God to take me back in my history of things and be like, purity, oh, and just feel convicted. But ultimately, it's simply a metaphor for a larger issue that he's talking about. Because if you go back and look at word study again, the definition of this word as he's using it, he's using it in the context of ethical and moral purity. And so when people are looking at me later on, he's literally going to say, uh, backing up um, in verse 4 from the verse that I just uh, read before, in verse 4, you adulterous people, you know that friendship with the world is enmity with God. He's using the marriage metaphor. He's like, you get it when you see a couple and you realize, oh, wait a minute. I saw her or I saw him out. I didn't know they were married. Why? Because they were talking to this person real friendly and then they were talking to that person real friendly and they were talking to that person extra friendly and now I'm seeing them and exactly you understand in the marriage context how that obscures what's going on he's saying that's morally what God is getting at in terms of this issue of purity and if you understand how hurtful it would feel to hear that about your spouse understand God's perspective when he's talking about this whole concept of of truth and integrity. 
and righteousness and loyalty. Why? Because backing up to chapter one, one of the things that he's also going to talk about in a lot of ways is that issue of, um, we've already read it, um, purity. Um, and also the purity um, as it relates to the tongue. Verse 26, if anyone thinks he's religious, as we said it again, and does not bridle his tongue but deceives his heart, this person's religious is, religion is worthless. Religion that is pure and undefiled before God is this, to visit the orphans and widows in their afflictions and to keep oneself unstained from the, from the world. That doesn't even seem like a verse that applies to us very much anymore today. Why? Because we got folks who take care of that. We got you know, talk to one of our visitors this morning, somebody who's dedicated their life or at least a portion of their time, to looking after people in their time of need. And this is one of the um, places in the, in, the, in the scriptures when in my um, biblical youth, when I first, I was still in preaching school, interning. At a time I told you before, I like to pick my own passages to preach because it's just easier that way if I'm coming from something I think I'm familiar with. But I got assigned this passage by a church one time. And I looked at it like, what's here? There's nothing to talk about. And then I read and I did a word study and I realized the looking after, the visiting, it's not visiting, it's caring for. It's making sure that they're actually um, secure in, otherwise, in ways they otherwise wouldn't be secure. And so understand how that issue of purity plays into visiting the orphans and widows. Those are people who even, I was a big old, we talked about it before, I don't even like using the term, I was a great big old social justice warrior, confession. That was a profession for me. That was my focus. Why should it surprise you? Before I became a preacher, I was a public defender. I represented people who can't get money, who can't afford a lawyer, right? All right, so it shouldn't surprise you. That's my confession. Fine, start throwing stones. Anyway, <laughs> bottom line is that was natural for me, but I looked at that passage and I was like, we don't do that. We don't need that. They got people who take care of that, right? People we commonly overlook because that's their life, <laughs> right? And that's what they do on a daily basis. So we delegate that out as if that's not our responsibility. But he's literally defining religion for me here. What is religion? It's not for me to delegate it out to somebody else who looks after it. It's for me to understand that it's not necessarily my attendance. It's not necessarily where I'm throwing my, my chips in the pot. It is am I personally taking responsibility for looking after people and widows and orphans is their time. For the people in our society who struggle to care for themselves. He's literally defining religion for me. And the reason why I ended up thanking that congregation for assigning this to me is even as a second year preaching student, I didn't fully understand what religion really meant. And so when they assigned it to me, it's a relatively wealthy congregation. They were helping me to understand where my priorities really needed to be in understanding what religion meant. And so when he's talking about purity, he was like, okay, it's one thing to say that I am a believer or a Christian, but purity means that much like you don't want to have to hear those stories about, oh, wait a minute, your significant other or your loved one being out with, God doesn't want to hear stories about me on the one hand, trying to do some nice things for um, the people who the widows and the orphans, but then spending the rest of my time with people who are completely um, even opposed to the things that God is saying are in their interest. God doesn't want me saying that, oh yes, I need to use my mouth to encourage the downtrodden and the people who really are struggling to care for themselves. But then I'm spending my time around people who are making their burdens even heavier. Our brother's prayer request. Forgive me for using it, but it's one that hits close to home because when I was coming back from the mission field, later on, James is going to talk about those who oppress the wage earners like he was speaking out of the book. We can't encourage those who are oppressed and they're struggling just to get their check that they're probably working way too many hours for, but then in an impure way spend our time encouraging the people who are cheating them out of their check. And so when God is saying pure and undefined, I need purity, understand how much you want purity in your relationships. And then understand what God is talking about beyond sexual purity. When he was talking about, I need a clear image of who you are as a believer because you are supposed to be a light in the world. And that light is supposed to be undefiled in this generation. 
and I don't need you with one foot in, yes, empathy be warm and filled, right? And another foot actually encouraging the very people who are helping to oppress the ones for whom we're offering up prayers. Why is that? Is that Marcus, you making that up? Yes, I make a lot of things up, but that, not this one. Why? <laughs> <laughs> because, hey, the very next section, we're not going to have time to go through it. In chapter 2, it's a famous section. Verse 1, my brothers, show no partiality as you hold the faith in our Lord Jesus Christ, um, the Lord of glory. For if a man wearing a um, gold ring and fine clothing comes into your assembly, and the poor man in shabby clothing also comes in, and you pay attention to the one who wears fine clothing and says, you sit here in a good place, while you say to the poor man, you stand over there or sit down at my feet. Have you not made distinctions among yourselves and become judges with evil, evil thoughts? Listen, my beloved brothers, has not God chosen those who are poor in this world to be rich in faith and heirs of the kingdom, which has been promised to those who love him? But you have dishonored the poor man. Are not the rich the ones who oppress you? The ones who drag you into court? Are they not the ones who blaspheme the honorable name by which you were called? And the whole issue of, um, of money is going to come up a number of times. We've already uh, I passed by it in verse 9 of chapter 1. Let the lowly brother boast in his exaltation and the rich in his humiliation, because like a flower um, of the grass, he will pass away. For the sun rises with its scorching heat and withers the grass. Its flower falls and its beauty perishes. So also the rich man will fade away in the midst of his pursuits. James, why are you so mad at the rich? I don't think James is mad at the rich as much as he's mad at the effects that having too much of a focus on um, my bank account has on the people who I could be helping. Skip forward to chapter 5. Chapter 5, verse 1. Come now, you rich, weep and howl for the miseries that are coming upon you. Your riches have rotted and your garments are moth-eaten. Your gold and silver have corroded and their corrosion will be evidence against you and will eat your flesh like fire. You have laid up treasure in the last days. Behold, the wages of the laborers who have mowed your fields, which you kept back by fraud, are crying out against you. And the cries of the harvester have reached the ears of the Lord of hosts. Oh, my God. This is, you know, that's not to take the name of the Lord in vain, but just this morning, I was praying for wisdom. As to how to communicate this in the right way, because it says, if any of you lacks wisdom, we already read it. Pray to God. There's so much going on here. I don't know how to communicate it. But ultimately, the thing he showed me this morning I hadn't seen all week was how this affects prayer. And God willing, we'll get to that at the very end. But ultimately, what he is talking about is in this concept of um, the rich, it just brought to mind um, the mission field, the mission field, the mission field. And the number of times I've told you how money affects things on the mission field and how there are times when people who are in such abject poverty, even in the churches, they will neglect the doctrine of the Bible simply to please people in the churches who they perceive as having money. I've seen it over and over again. I've seen people in congregations where they are desperately needing financial resources, doing anything they can. They will literally partner in doing wicked things to other brethren just to please people who are um, coming into town with a big wallet. And here's the thing, I've seen some of those people down the road struggle. And the only people they're comfortable asking money for it from down the road are the people they partnered with in doing wicked things. So to please a visitor with a, we'll call it a big wallet, they'll partner in oppressing one of their brethren. But when they're in a serious state of need, they don't have the courage to call the brother with the big wallet because they know that that brother's heart, they've seen what's on that brother's heart. And it's an unbelievably humbling thing to watch them have to go back and call the person who they helped to basically, I don't know, oppress, <laughs> whatever, when in their time of need, they know that the person who they ended up backstabbing was the only person they could really trust. And so that is what this passage is talking about. Go back to chapter 2, but um, verse 6. Are not the, uh, the, the rich the ones who oppress you and the ones who drag you into court? Are they not the ones who blaspheme the honorable name by which you were called? He's saying at any income level, the one thing I talked about before from the mission field is the beauty of poverty is it exposed what was on the character of the people there. You drain my bank account, I'll be doing the same things in many ways. Or if I'm not doing the same things, you will be exposing my potential to do the exact same things under pressure. And that's one of the things I realized watching TV again just yesterday. I was getting nostalgic. Um, watching brothers struggle in Zambia, a truck driver who's trying to drive, but it seemed every, every 50 miles he was trying to fix his truck <laughs> because it's breaking down every so often along the way. If that's what I'm driving and that's my living, look, my, my, my car just gets me to and from where I need to be. 
but I'm going to be making a lot of different decisions if I'm economically desperate. And so that's what he's talking about. He's like, be careful of the decisions you make under economic desperation. Why? Because the big pockets aren't always the ones that you can trust in your genuine time of need. And so he's saying when that person walks in in shabby clothing, understand we have a, have a distinction drawn. The Bible sometimes will say, okay, or, or Jesus said, if they do these things when the leaf is green, what are they going to do in times of economic desperation? And that means this, if God has blessed us to be in a situation where we have enough, he's saying make sure you're establishing healthy partnerships when times are good because when you're under pressure, you don't know what you'll do to feed your kids. And so the things that you're doing now have everything to do with what you will do when you are under pressure and life throws you curveballs. And you are now having to make decisions at a crossroads. I've talked about it before. I don't have time to really fumble through the scriptures to find the right place to go when I'm actually real time having to make that decision at a crossroads. So when Jesus is saying, if this is what they'll do when the leaf is green, he's like, look, these are people who, what I'm saying is, they're not steadfast in a good season. And God's going to pull the plug on prosperity to show what we'll really do when it's not going so good and so are we steadfast when things are good so that when we're under pressure even if oh well of course I wouldn't you know overly um, lean toward the, the the rich now because yeah I got plenty of money in my pocket but if I'm in a situation where when I have plenty I'm not focusing on the things that are of God looking after the people who he's told me to look after acquiring a genuine love for them and an empathy for the struggles that they're going through then when I'm starting to struggle Marcus might be telling a story about the weird things he's seen people do for money on the mission field, but he might be emulating that story once his bank account is empty. And so he's saying, while the leaf is green, condition your heart to love the things that God loves. Last thing, um, I think it's the last thing. Oh, where am I? Where am I? Sorry. Yeah, we'll make it the last thing. Sorry. <laughs> We've talked about how James has talked about, look, are we well watered or are we watered down from the perspective? Okay, what's your attitude towards your money? What's your attitude towards purity? Are we presenting a pure picture? And what's your attitude towards your mouth? As um, Brian has already read, let's uh, back up to chapter 1, verse 19. Chapter 1, verse 19. Know this, my beloved brothers. Let every person be quick to hear slow to speak and slow to anger for the anger of man does not produce the righteousness of God. It's not the last time he's going to talk about the mouth. Brian's already read it in chapter three. We won't go uh, through it all again, but please skip down to chapter 10 where he sums up much of what he talked about in the first part of chapter three, where he says from the same mouth come blessing and cursing my brothers. These things ought not to be so. Sorry, please also skip down to chapter four, verse 11. Do not speak evil against one another, brothers. The one who speaks against a brother judges his brother. Um, sorry, the one who speaks against a brother or judges his brother speaks evil against the law and judges the law. But if you judge the law, you are not a doer of the law, but a judge. There is one lawgiver and one judge, he who is able to save and to destroy. But who are you to judge your neighbor? In chapter five, he's going to pick it up again. In, uh, between verses seven and twelve. He's going to really talk about it twice in two different ways. Verse 9, do not grumble against one another, brothers, so that you may not be judged. Behold, the judge is standing at the door. In verse 12, but above all, my brothers, do not swear either by heaven or by earth or by any other oath, but let your yes be yes and your no be no so that you may not fall under condemnation. And he's going to imply it or infer it in some different ways because he's going to talk about prayer as he ends up the book. And if you have a heading at the beginning of uh, verse 13, he's going to talk about the prayer of faith in some versions. But ultimately, it's that famous passage where it talks about the prayer of a righteous person has much power. And of course, prayer doesn't always have to be audible. But there are times if you're up under enough distress, you're going to pray out loud. Or sometimes when we're leading a group prayer. That is another form of audible prayer that is not disconnected from the way I'm using my mouth in between the times I'm going to God seeking his assistance or help either on behalf of other people or on my own behalf. And so therefore, the way that I'm using my mouth in the meantime has everything to do with the way that he's answering my prayers when I lift them up to him. So he's saying back in verse 12, when he's saying don't take an oath, we've talked about this before when Jesus said, don't take an oath. This reaches back to that. It's basically don't puff, right? 
If I am saying, let my yes be yes and simply my no be no, he's like, don't try to sell it, Marcus. Don't try to inflate the value of what it is that you're talking about. Just be straightforward. Don't try to impress God with, God, I'm willing to sacrifice this and this and that if you will simply, and I say that from experience. Why? Because back before I knew what it meant to be steadfast, there are things that I would say, oh, God, I want this so bad, da 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 da, -da. And my mouth would write a check that it couldn't fulfill. My heart was real desperate in a moment that my character wasn't able. That's why it says run with endurance. We talked about before, I stole from D.D. Jakes. He said, try not to make decisions when you're tired or hungry or angry. Why? Because you don't necessarily run with the same endurance when you're not tired and hungry and angry. And so if you're making vows over the time when you want, want it real bad, but you're not thinking, OK, counting the cost, like he said, as a disciple, can you really finish this race? He's like, you have to pull yourself back from the emotion of the moment and say, can I really sustain this thing that I'm asking God to give me? Or can I really pay the price that I'm saying I'm willing to pay for this victory, Jephthah? I love that story because I feel like Jephthah. <laughs> I know what it's like to be in deprivation and pray, God, oh, if you only, only not to have counted the cost. And so one of the reasons why he's talking about it's not just not talking about your brother and this and this and that, is you have to have a heart. Understand, Satan drags you out into places of desperation. He wants you to make a deal. He wants to work in your emotional pain and your agony uh, to help you say things that you really don't mean. So what God is saying in Jesus when he's preaching the Sermon on the Mount is the same thing that James is reminding us of here. It's like try to pray to God when the leaf is green to be steadfast so that we don't reach these emotional highs and lows that cause us to ask for things in an extreme moment that we can't sustain during our times of stability over this marathon that is life. So when he's saying be steadfast, he's saying that's the hack that helps me overcome my temptation to, to make an oath when I just really need to say yes or no. The grumbling and um, in verse 9, and then back in don't speak evil against one another in verse 11. We talked about this periodically through um, you know, different passages, but, but understand this. Sometimes it's, just under, it's good to, to, to revisit it from the perspective, okay, what does that look played out? Uh, I used to listen to this radio program by uh, another believer who, who calls it Think It Through. Because he said so often when we get in those moments where we're either at an emotional high or an emotional low and we don't have the wherewithal to think it through, sometimes just taking a second to get in the habit of thinking it through helps us to see what we talked about before, the ahari, a Hebrew word that means the end of a thing. And so one of the things that Satan typically blinds me to is the end of a thing when I'm so enthused about the beginning or the praying or the sacrifice that I'm willing to make, I think, for that which I want. He's saying calm down and look at the end of a thing. And understand this as we talked about it before. If, I'm just going to tell the story because I don't have enough time to try to work my way around it artfully. I'm already pushing time, at least for what I said for myself. I had a chance to see a missionary come back to a congregation um, after he spent some time on the mission field. There's a congregation where, you know, he had a mixed response. He uh, had some good times there, but there was some, you know, some seeds there that just, they weren't, they weren't so well watered, we would say. And it bred for some lingering conflict, and that came back up when I saw this missionary come back to that certain spot. And so it got bad enough that there were a certain number of men, because there were a lot of men that this, this congregation would, would send to preach. And it got bad enough to where they would send man after man to preach these hatchet jobs at this missionary after he came back from the field. And if you've ever seen hatchet jobs from the, the, the pulpit, um, they don't tend to go so good. So hopefully this doesn't come off as a hatchet job, because, yeah. <laughs> And so there's a time you can tell, okay, that just seems like it came from the word of God. But then sometimes it just seems like, okay, that's a personal issue. And this was happening over and over again. And ultimately, during the short time that this missionary was there, he actually helped to, help, help to baptize somebody. Um, to help add to this congregation while he's taking this heat. And ultimately, um, as they were coming together toward the time, um, it was toward the time for this missionary to leave this congregation, um, he was coming back to visit, um, he was trying to think of the ways in which he could bring up, okay, how can we have peace in this situation? And the thing that was happening is in the leadership at that church, um, at best, they were batting 500, meaning everybody at that church had basically lost one of their kids, right? 
meaning not into to, to death, but they basically fallen away. And so everybody at that congregation that was allowing these men to get up one after another and go after this guy, they were all praying at the same time for God to save their kids who had strayed and left the church. And the one thing that this missionary ended up just basically saying was the only thing I think God's left on my heart is to say this, is if this is the way you treat someone who's left all of this to go serve God, why would I answer your prayers for the salvation of your kids who are seeking their own self-interest? And the conversation was over. There was no great spat, no great disagreement, but understand when he's talking about this whole concept of speaking evil and grumbling, and he then connects it to the issue of prayer, understand, when I saw that situation, what I began to realize is the way that I use my mouth in peacetime has everything to do with whether or not God is going to answer my prayers in those emotional highs and those emotional lows. See, if I have been using my mouth disparagingly between my prayer time, why would I expect God to answer prayers for a lesser sacrifice than the one I'm really offering up, right? And so that is why we don't have to go back through the same ground that we've treaded on this, reason, this, um, um, this, this ground of um, why it's important not to grumble. We've seen it in Hebrews, right? Extended discussion in Hebrews in chapters 3 through 4. Back when Paul is um, counseling Timothy and Titus, it's a recurring issue that he's dealing with, with each of these ministers that he's counseling at these different churches. And then back before we got to the prison epistles where he was writing the more favorable letters to congregations that seemed to have a good foundation, it was the thing he was dealing with in uh, the churches in Rome, um, definitely at Corinth where he has to write them at least twice, um, and then again in the churches of Galatia. He's dealing with the divisions at those, those junctures at each time. And so understand here, this is the contrast that I want you to see in understanding how we um, understand how God hears prayers. Please turn with me to chapter 4, chapter 4. And he's talking about verses 1 through 4. What causes quarrels and what causes fights among you? Is it not this, that your passions are at war within you? You desire and do not have, so you murder. You covet and cannot obtain, so you fight and quarrel. You do not have because you do not ask. You ask and do not receive because you ask wrongly to spend it on your passions. I'll stop at verse 3. And the thing that hit me just this morning as I was reading through was contrasting that to chapter 5. The part I left off or probably didn't emphasize so much when we read um, chapter 5, it begins in verse 1. Come now, you rich who weep and howl. And we talked about the wages. I left off at the part in verse 4 that says, Behold, the wages of the laborers who have mowed your fields, which you kept back. By fraud are crying out against you, and the cries of the harvesters have reached the ears of the Lord of hosts. We talked about this last week. Not every prayer reaches the ears of the Lord. So understand the contrast that James is drawing between prayers he is, God is hearing and prayers that he's just not hearing. He's saying, look, you're praying with your self-interest in mind in chapter 4. That prayer ain't getting it done, bud. But the prayers that are reaching his ears are the prayers of the people that you may be, if you pay attention to what you're saying, the prayers of the people that you may be um, 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 oppressing are the ones that he's actually hearing. So why is it so important for me to have a heart or have my heart, David, a man after God's own heart? It's to understand what God is really hearing. Why? Because if I don't take the time to understand that, I might find myself partnering in the activities that shut God's ears to my own prayer life. So it's not simply making sure that I'm looking after somebody else's reputation. We said, fake it till you make it. Sometimes I just have to do the right thing for the wrong reason if I can at least get my heart <laughs> in the right place to be corrected. Why? Because this isn't a book about me fixing myself. James is a book about me, just like he said in Hebrews, being purified. And once again, if we back up to verse 11, Verse 11 of chapter 5. And he's talking about patience under trial. After talking about that verse in uh, verse 9, we talked about not grumbling against one another. He doesn't leave it on a, a sour note, and that's what I want to make sure I'm not to do today. In verse 10, he's talking about patience and long-suffering because that's the thing that produces purity. 
As an example of suffering and patience, brothers, take the prophets who spoke in the name of the Lord. Behold, we consider blessed those who remained steadfast. You have heard of the steadfastness of Job, and you have seen the purpose of the Lord, how the Lord is compassionate and merciful. And that's the point of this lesson. See, we all come to the table with varying degrees of things that we need to purify out of our lives. We used the me metaphor last week of the great statue of iron and clay, or sorry, with feet of iron and clay coming out of Daniel's prophecy, talking about those four kingdoms that would come in the days of the days immediately after Nebuchadnezzar. And the weakness of one was though it had feet of iron, a very strong material that was mixed with clay. We talked about the degree to which, if I understand the degree of my uh, Christianity that is iron, that's good. But if I fixate only on the iron and don't understand the part that is clay, I'm in a precarious situation, ready to fall, just like that kingdom prophesied by God. And so what he's saying is do a serious self-examination as you read through the book of James and understand the things that he's saying. Marcus, these are the pieces of your ministry that may be iron. They are well rooted in God. But Marcus, these are the pieces of your ministry that are, in fact, clay. And make no mistake, I'm not just going to reward you for the iron. I need you to seriously self-examine and work on the clay. And so that's what the book of James is talking about in many ways. Like we said, this is a scratch the surface look at what he's talking about because ultimately um, the parts, to use another metaphor of my life, that are well watered, we want to make sure those are watered even more. But the parts of my life that are watered down, that aren't showing a pure reflection of who God really is and who Jesus actually was as he walked in this world, those are the places where I need to to clear out and make sure that I am projecting the picture of Christ. Preach a, a sermon on the mission field called um, Weak Tea, Weak Tea. And it was because in a situation of economic deprivation, one of the things hosts would do was I was surprised when I drink tea over on the mission field in certain places. I was like, y'all put more sugar in it than we do. <laughs> it's like, wait, isn't it supposed to be the good stuff? I'm like one nation south of Kenya. I want the good tea. Where is it? Well, the good tea is only a place where you can afford it. <laughs> and so the sweet tea was often an indication that you were getting uh, the tea we could afford. So how did I learn that? I was like, no, 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 don't give me the American flavored tea. You give me the regular strength tea. And so they poured a cup of that tea, and oh, it tasted like dishwater. <laughs> so <laughs> that weak tea was folks who didn't have, trying to stretch. And so sometimes that's what we do as Christians. He's calling us to be pure. Jesus said, look, if I gave Kenya the soil to produce great tea, that's what I want you representing, right? It's one thing for you to serve that ultra sweet tea if that's all you got. But understand as believers, when the leaf is green, when the season is green, I need you projecting the best of what I've given you the uh, ability to do. Gretzky's dad is much of the reason why we can thank the world or thank, look, Gretzky for being Gretzky? Anyway, because if he doesn't instill in his kid the need, sorry, <laughs> to be consistent and be a professional every time out, we don't have a great one. <laughs> we just have hockey <laughs> without that period of history where you might want to go back and YouTube and see what it was like. Yeah, so he was the Jordan of hockey for a while. But anyway, <laughs> his strength was the fact that he was steadfast. And that's what James is calling us to do. Whatever you gather out of the different things, whether it's my attitude towards money, my attitude towards my mouth, or my attitude towards purity, understand the hack in all these things is being a professional, whether we feel like it or not. My prayer for you is my prayer for me, that we all be a professional and be a blessing to the people around us.